Welcome to everyone. Um, uh, I'm the associate professor here at the University of Melbourne and, the, and one of the co-authors of, of the book we're going to discuss today, The Post-Soviet as uh, Post-Colonial. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, this is the final, um, the final webinar in our uh, global public law series here at the Center for Comparative Constitutional Studies at the University of Melbourne Law School. Um, before we start, I know many of you are joining from all around the world, uh, but, but I'm currently sitting um, in, in uh, Melbourne and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land upon which I'm sitting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and acknowledge their uh, elders and pay respect to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. Now, today's uh, webinar, I'm really excited to, to talk about, not, not because I wrote that because I wrote the book and we're talking about my book, but largely because the book is an attempt to start a discussion about um, a, broad, a couple different things, which we're going to be discussing. We're going to be talking about the relationship between post-coloniality, uh, decolonization, and constitutional change and constitutional law. We're going to be talking about uh, a region that, until quite recently, has not been viewed as post-colonial. I think since the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, by the Russian Federation on the 24th of February of this year, 2022. There has been a lot of discussion of this, but prior to that, there really hadn't been as much discussion of the region, the post, the former Soviet Union as a former colonial space. Um, so we're gonna be discussing that as well. And we're gonna be thinking about what this tells us, what a post-colonial paradigm, as we call it in the book, helps us understand about constitutions in general. Um, in particular, what it might help us do as we move away or, or as we change the paradigm or the, the lens at which we look at constitutions from one where we generally view constitutional change as something through the lens of authoritarianism, democracy, through um, political ordering towards a post-colonial frame. What does that do? Well, how does it change our view um, and help us understand or what, what different parts of constitutions does it understand? And three things that are, I think are gonna emerge broadly across the discussion today. One is that it does um, help us see much more clearly the relationship between history and constitutional law um, and how in particular constitutions become important places for enacting and actually reflecting official historical memory. Uh, and that's really obviously very important in a post-colonial project or setting. We also think about the expressive role of constitutions. So not just what constitutions do, but how they express national identity uh, through symbols, through language, through other forms of constitutional rendering. Um, and third is the, is the political role of constitutions, right? Beyond courts, a post-colonial framing really focuses us on the idea of how constitutions in, engaged in legitimate framing of public order. Um, and we're doing that and can, can be thinking about this and we do that in the book itself in looking very much at the former Soviet republics as well as uh, Eastern Central Europe, the former Soviet bloc, the Warsaw nation countries. Um, now, as I suggested before, this, this webinar is going to be like the book. It's introductory. It's going to proceed from a discussion of the book, but really turn to what this book raises, what questions. So we want to think of this as a book discussion uh, where the book is the beginning of a broader discussion. Of, of, of how we can begin to think about and understand these ideas. Now, it's gonna be structured uh, as follows. We're gonna start with Professor Dr. Herbert Cooper, my co-author, who's going to give a, a, a short introduction to the book itself. Um, it was its main, uh, its main uh, introductory or main kind of points and so forth. Uh, Professor Cooper is the managing director of the Institute for East European Law in, in, in Regensburg. Osterecht, Institute for Osterecht in Regensburg, and also has recently uh, taken up a position as Dozent at the Andrasi German-speaking university in Budapest and the chair for European administrative law and jurisprudence. So Herbert will start us off. We're then after that will be followed by Maria Malksu, um, who will be looking at questions of, of how post-coloniality and the region, the post-Soviet region. Uh, Maria Malksu is an associate professor at the center for military studies at the Department of Political Science in the University of Copenhagen. Uh, that Maria will be followed by Arman Mazmianen, uh, who will be speaking on to the to really to the question of how postcoloniality impacts constitutional change around the former Soviet Republic, uh, 
Armand is an expert on Central Asia, Central and the Caucasus, uh, as well as Russia. So we'll be able to really think through some of the kind of more specific regional uh, issues. And finally, uh, Dinesha Samararatne will be speaking to questions of what does this region, which has not really been thought of yet as, as a post-colonial one, what does that help us understand about the burgeoning field of uh, post-coloniality and constitutional law um, and in a, in a field that uh, you know, is, is, is emerging, what, what do we learn from this region? What she can, what she can tell us about that? And Dinesha uh, Samararatne is a senior lecturer um, uh, at the Department of Public and International Law at the University of Colombo, the Faculty of Law there at the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. Um, so we will have these kind of this discussion. This discussion is going to take around 45 minutes to 45, 50 to 55 minutes, and will be followed by question and answers. Um, so with no further ado, I will now hand over to, um, to Herbert Cooper to introduce, introduce the book. Thanks, Herbert. Yes, thanks, Will. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Good morning from a European perspective. Hello and good evening to Australia. To prove that I am a co-author, I'll show you my copy as well. Uh, Will, you asked me to give a short introduction, which everybody who knows a German law professor knows that the word short is a really major challenge. Um, but being a German law professor, I'm expected to start my presentation with a Latin quote, which I will do in order not to disappoint you. Um, and that Latin quote is Haben zum Fatum uh, Libelli. Each book has its own fate. Um, and I would like to start my short presentation uh, telling you how this book uh, came about to be written. It was in early 2020, uh, Corona just started, or was about to start, uh, that Will and I met in Nagoya on a conference. And at dinner, we sat next to each other and chatted about Eastern Europe and post-Soviet space. And we uh, confessed to each other that we both had had the idea that a post-colonial view might explain more of that region than we had of explanations so far. Um, so we very quickly decided to write an essay about it. And then we started to um, write uh, um, an expose of such an essay. And the, the draft, the expose itself was already 50 pages. So we, then we knew that uh, uh, an essay was out of question, so it would have to be a book, and it came about rather quickly. I think it was one and a half years um, of work, essentially, that, that we took on it, which I think is rather quick. Um, um, and, uh, well, it's up to you to decide whether it was worth it or not, the effort. Um, the basic thesis of our book. Um, well, we try, as Will told you already, to analyze constitutional development in the countries of the former Soviet bloc since the end of communism. Um, so far, the dominant theory or lens has been democratic constitutionalism, which explains a lot, but we are convinced that a post-colonial theory gives additional insights in the constitutional dynamics of that region. I would like to stress additional because we do not want to replace um, constitutional, uh, uh, democratic constitutionalism and its, its lens from its throne. Um, we think that that should remain in the, uh, that, that should remain the focal point, but we should not neglect post-colonial theory to um, explain those lacunae that uh, post-democratic post, uh, constitutional uh, theory leaves. Well, if you look at the region post-Soviet bloc, um, under the lens of democratic constitutionalism, we notice what democratic constitutionalism would identify as shortcomings. Um, some or other, the most uh, obvious shortcomings are that some countries never really developed into a constitutional system, a democratic constitutional system, although the constitutional text may suggest this. I think maybe the most obvious Example of this is Central Asia, where constitutional text sounds rather nicely, but political realities are really different. Um, in other countries, you have uh, the phenomenon that they first embarked on a way to a democratic constitutional system, but then somewhere midway, they decided otherwise. The most spectacular cases are the so-called illiberal uh, governments of Hungary and Poland, 
you could also, in a way, uh, classify Russia in this respect, although I personally have my doubts whether they really ever embarked really on a way to democratic constitutionalism beyond constitutional text. Um, so democratic constitutionalism can describe and deplore this phenomenon, which it interprets as a rollback, but it cannot really explain it. And this is where in our, uh, uh, in our thinking post-colonial theory comes in, because here we have uh, a different point of view, which looks at things differently and yields some explanations that democratic constitutionalism does not yield. As a starting point, we uh, say that the Soviet Union was an empire that answers to the definition of colonialism. I think this is established now. And this, this discussion, whether the Soviet Union was colonial, that happened even before uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. I think this can be uh, accepted as, a, as an established point of view. Um, in the Soviet um, empire, we have a center, which was Russia. Um, then we had an inner empire, which were the non-Russian uh, Soviet republics. And if you want to really go into the details, you would also have to classify the non-Russian periphery within the Russian socialist uh, Fed, uh, republic as a sort of colonial space. But we do not want to make things uh, overly complicated in a book which is intended to start a discussion. Um, so we have a center. We have an inner empire, the non-Russian republics. And we have an outer empire, the satellite states, which had at least nominally a statehood and nationhood of their own, but were politically not, not independent. So what happened after the end of the empire? Here, our book classifies these three regions, and we look at these three regions differently or separately, because uh, um, they each have their own lessons to, to yield. First, we look at Russia. and. After 1991, at least 1993, with the new um, post-Soviet constitution, it seemed that Russia more or less seems to have as acquiesced into the loss of its empire. So it seemed to accept more or less that its global empire was lost. But at the same time, it upheld its, its, uh, the colonial structures and in the center peripheral relations within the Russian Federation. So um, we might say that the traditional Russian greater Russian Soviet colonialism narrowed down on the Russian Federation, where we still have colonial type relations between the center and periphery, notably that they are based on ethnicity and race. Um, the most bloody example of this inner colonialism is uh, the Chechen wars. Um, still, when we look at the relationship of Russia towards the world, then the 1993 constitution seems to to suggest that Russia accepts it's no longer a world power, it's, its empire is lost beyond the borders of the Russian Federation, and that they more or less want to embark on a way towards democracy. Well, and that has changed under Putin. Um, Putin has made it clear from the very start that he wanted to reestablish the old empire again. First, nobody really took him seriously, now we know better. Um, in this reading, the even the constitutional amendments of 2020 are a coherent attempt to make the Russian state fit again for playing the role of a global center again. So the 2020 constitution with enhancing the strongman president, et cetera, et cetera, in this reading um, wants to make Russia or, or put Russia into a position where it can play the role that Putin would like it to play, which is the center of a global colonial empire. Um, if we look at the constitutional dynamics of the inner empire from the Baltics to Central Asia, <clears throat> then we have a, a typical post-colonial situation. There are needs of state building and nation building. There were, there were very blatant needs in the 90s to uh, providing basic state services in a tumultuous and if economic, economically different situations. And all these urgent needs seem to be much more pressing than the establishment of democratic structures. And so for many of these countries, a strong man presidentialism seemed the natural choice, because if you have a strong man at the top of the state, then this strong man might navigate the newly independent state through the troubled waters that the state was in. An, exa uh, an exception were the Baltic states, where there always had been the legal theory that um, belonging to the Soviet Union was illegal and that the uh, interwar republics never had really lost their legal personality. So there again, it was a bit different. We looked at that as well. 
Um, so the Baltic Republics, though, uh, having been a part of the inter inner empire, they were more um, like the uh, situation in the outer empire. In the outer empire, they were the satellite states which had had their own state, their own nation through, uh, throughout the Soviet dominance as well. Um, there you had no such problems as in the inner empire because the state machinery as such was there. Um, they only had to uh, turn into formal statehood. Um, here, the discussions of the past are most revealing because there the focus lies on, uh, strangely enough, on the domestic communists and not on the Soviet Union as the colonial power. Even in those uh, countries uh, which had suffered an invasion like, like Czechoslovakia, Hungary or Poland, even there, the, the focus of uh, looking at the colonial past is a domestic perspective, strangely enough. And in this strange, distorted um, perspective, um, the new illib illiberal governments can paint a distorted picture of the former dependence from a colonial center and use, uses that to, uh, to establish and widen its own powers. I think this should be enough as a very short um, introduction in what our book says. And now I'm infinitely proud of myself for having uh, succeeded in being short, which, as I said, is a usually an unsurmountable obstacle for a German professor. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Herbert. It is, it is it's 240 pages done in about five minutes. It's just, it's just very impressive. Maria, um, turn it over to you to um, to talk us through the first question of of this of this region and postcoloniality, the post-Soviet region. Tell us more. Thanks very much, Will and Herbert, uh, for the invitation and congratulations on the book. It is precisely as as uh, Professor Cooper said, uh, an invitation. Uh, and an opening uh, of, of the further debate and taking this discussion that has actually been long brewing uh, in, uh, say, political science and cultural studies, uh, whether or not the post-Soviet space could also be studied from the post-colonial lens to the realm of comparative constitutionalism, which I think is a very, very welcome opening indeed. So in my 10 minutes or so, uh, I'll uh, place the question about the analytical purchase of the post-colonial perspective in analyzing the post-Soviet space against the broader backdrop of the controversies that are actually still related to the applicability of the post-colonial label to the former Second World. So uh, there is still this, this question, regardless of, of uh, Professor Kuper's remark that, uh, that it is established that uh, Russia and the Soviet Union was uh, an empire by, by certain basic parameters. Um, this question whether post-Soviet states could be captured in the purview of post-colonial theory continues to divide scholarship. And I guess this is uh, therefore also an important question to explore. Why does it do that? And, and perhaps what does the relative invisibility still of post-Soviet states, or you, know, you could say standard ignorance of post-Soviet states by post-colonial theory tell us about this theory more generally? So when we invoke post-coloniality, we of course need to first clarify what it refers to. So broadly speaking, post-colonial theory is interested in various schemes of domination. Since it empirically draws on subaltern studies and the South Asia experience of empire, its traditional focus has been mostly on the British empire, which of course has also consequently served as a very important object of condemnation for this body of scholarship. Uh, and therefore, Postcolonial theory, uh, by rule, has not really delved into the legacies of the Russian imperialism, which has remained uh, relatively invisible for postcolonial studies as such. Um, so, in recent years, of course, you know, it's fair to say that the experiences of this former Second World inhabitants have been brought into the fold of the traditional European. Um, uh, imperialism um, uh, overseas, and and uh, this book is a very important um, contribution to that very debate. So uh, you provide a very straightforward uh, definition of post-colonialism, the end of colonial dominance of one political entity over a territory with another uh, identity. 
And I guess uh, it's worthwhile when we start peeling back uh, to recall that actually the very term of decolonization, which of course is related to the whole discussion of, of post-colonial spaces, um, which again in our minds perhaps is traditionally associated with the emancipation of the Western colonies in Africa and Asia and the Caribbean, was first used in the English language in the 1930s to link uh, the independence of the emancipated states, which had emerged uh, from the dismantled Habsburg and Russian empires in Eastern Europe post First World War, with an argument for the liberation of nations uh, in what we know today as the so-called global South. So it is against that backdrop that um, historians such as James Mark and, and uh, Queen Slobodian have, have actually called the East European space the first site of decolonization in the 20th century. And that by, of course, uh, by implication, also a post-colonial space. But still, you know, as 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 I have said uh, a couple of times already, um, the the post-Soviet space has been largely absent in the discussions about the historic process of decolonization in social sciences, uh, which is a process which refers to to the transition from the world of empires to to that of sovereign states. And the reasons for that are, of course, manifold, and, and, and many of them are also engaged in the book. So for one, uh, we could say that uh, the Russian uh, and, of course, the Soviet colonization project was supposedly different, uh, and perhaps particularly different when we um, look at uh, the process of, of, of uh, engaging Ukraine and Belarus which actually reminds uh, more clearly of an assimilation project uh, in a land-based empire. So, uh, you know, when we look back at the sort of Tsarist era during the uh, 18th and 20th centuries, Russia was building a continental empire where its uh, Slavic brothers, so to speak, were to be amalgamated into, uh, which also meant that um, their distinct identities were actually uh, negated. They were denied even to exist. And of course they were, you know, simultaneously sought to be erased. So, uh, you know, this is what some scholars would refer to as the dynastic type of colonization when it came to Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova, where basically the local elites were assimilated into the imperial project and colonial relations were also ethnicized in a way that, that uh, their local vernacular languages and culture became uh, a stigma an object of shaming effectively. This was the, the, the sign of, of backwardness or, or uh, cultural blackness, if you will, a uh, sign of inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the supposed, uh, supposedly superior Russophones. Um, and, uh, and against that backdrop, it was precisely Ukraine that also became uh, one of the most notable examples of the Soviet internal uh, colonization projects, uh, it became one of the most notable uh, internal colonies. And I guess in that light, it's very interesting to, to recall uh, from earlier times, you know, pre-Soviet times, but, but from, uh, I think it's rather symptomatic, from, from mid-19th uh, century, 1863, there was an imperial decree which uh, banned Ukrainian language publications on the grounds that no separate little Russian language has existed, has ever existed, exists, or can exist. So again, you see, you know, I think it, it resonates uh, nicely with the idea of what uh, legal documents also do, uh, what are the expressive and, and performative, uh, well, what are the expressive sort of um, ambitions, uh, aspirations and performative effects, because here you see this interesting paradox of, of uh, having to uh, declare the non-existence of something and yet to also regulate uh, the banning of this, something that supposedly does not even exist. So again, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that um, I guess we, we see uh, very much resonating in the contemporary context where, where Putin is waging a war uh, on uh, a people uh, that uh, supposedly also does not uh, exist as a nation.
right? And then, of course, among the other uh, dimensions of what made, uh, say, the Soviet um, uh, colonization project uh, or, or the Soviet Union as an empire, uh, a different kind of a project compared to the uh, Western maritime empires, for instance, I mean, there was this absence of clear racial difference between the colonizer and the colonized in the Soviet case. And of course, there were also very different uh, phases and phases of Russian colonialism. There was the already aforementioned uh, internal colonization. Uh, there was also importantly, and I think the book touches upon this too, this idea of reverse cultural colonization in the dynamic between Russo Soviet colonizers, which were actually perceived to be culturally inferior by their, for instance, Baltic, uh, which would be according to your categorization, sort of in between the inner and outer uh, empire, and then the other Central East European states, uh, you know, which also were uh, subjugated. Uh, through their satellite status uh, during the Cold War uh, years. And of course, there is also this important dimension that uh, you engage with in the book, uh, that the uh, economic aspect of the Soviet colonialism was perhaps uh, less important compared to, to its actual ideological drive, its political and, and security dimensions. Because uh, the USSR's imperial uniqueness uh, also was precisely in the fact that uh, that the non-Russian colonies, uh, you know, both provided raw materials to the metropole, but also they developed uh, in many ways at the cost of of the Russian center. But I think, you know, uh, in very important ways, the reason why the Soviet project has managed uh, to to escape also the the uh, the purview of much of the uh, post-colonial studies is of course uh, in uh, the soviet project depicting itself as staunchly anti-imperialist uh, in the first place in its international self-projection and in its you know uh, declared solidarity with the post-colonial world so there was always this question how could a power that was vigorously fighting the tentacles of western imperialism and standing uh, you know against colonialism in africa prominently and elsewhere how could this power be accused of actually you know engaging and practicing active colonial politics itself but you know as 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 many uh, perhaps prominently david johnny moore uh, and and uh, your book uh, continues in that tradition would argue by most classic measures still, you know, when we consider the lack of sovereign power, the restrictions on travel, the fact of the military occupation and, and, and lack of convertible money, uh, the way economy was organized, the way, uh, you know, there was forced education in the colonizer's language, then indeed we can say that, that, uh, that there was um, Russia-Soviet colonial control over uh, much of Central and Eastern Europe, you know, including obviously the Baltic states and then you know the the inner empire itself, roughly from from uh, the uh, you know the end of the Second World War till till 1989 or 1991. Uh, so we you know have all the parameters in terms of the centralization of power most prominently the political and military control and also the the official dominance of the language over uh, the vernacular languages and it is against this backdrop also that we can talk you know in the past um, perhaps decade uh, where this um, legalistic concept of you know what counts as colonization and colonialism has become uh, more relaxed concept. Uh, also, post-colonial studies have opened up to, to the discussion of this region uh, more uh, systematically, uh, even though I think there are still also pretty prominent voices who, who uh, also resist the idea that we should also globalize uh, the, the concept of decolonization and, and, uh, and our understanding of post-colonialism uh, more generally, because uh, some would warn that if we apply post-colonial lens to the spaces like you know, the post-communist space broadly conceived, this would threaten to dilute post-colonialism to um, arguably, you know, very 
uh, loose mobile framework which could be applicable to any self and other uh, relationships and therefore becomes uh, disconnected uh, from uh, specific histories of, of uh, formal empire and racial uh, uh, racialization. And I think the book uh, actually boldly shows us that uh, maybe this, this is uh, somewhat an unfounded uh, affair, at least it did to me. I think the book makes a bold contribution to our understanding of the relationship between uh, the post-Soviet space and post-coloniality and really offers us this vantage point uh, that enables us to see how constitution making in this very space uh, of uh, you know post soviet uh, slash post colonial uh, countries has sprung from and responded to to the very specific demands of de sovietization as decolonization and um, and what the book certainly cannot be accused of is insensitivity to different contexts. It's very very um, attentive to to uh, you know how this process has unfolded uh, in uh, these different layers of um, of the Soviet uh, Empire. The you know uh, Russia itself, of course, the USSR as the uh, inner empire, and then the Wars of Pact, uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, as its uh, outer empire. And of course, uh, and to go include on that point, uh, I think, again, you know, as it often happens, you, you said you started with the project, obviously, before uh, we uh, reach the point where we are now before the war, but uh, this also bespeaks to the uh, very timeliness and, and relevance of the book. Uh, because the war uh, that Russia currently wages against Ukraine has really brought uh, it all out in the open again. It uh, also has brought out the very aspect of the domestic component of, of Russian imperialism. Um, and, and it has, I guess, also put the discussions that were uh, brewing uh, in the calmer years about Russia itself as a kind of an actor in this self-inscribed subaltern position vis-a-vis -vis the West or vis-a-vis -vis Europe uh, on hold, at least for some time uh, being. So definitely this intricate power relationship or perhaps rather plural in power, power relations between the traditional empire and um, or traditional center and its historical margins, how they struggle for autonomy against the history of dependence. This is the question that continues to fascinate. And uh, I think this book uh, is a really fine, historically informed comparative constitutional law companion in this quest. And I guess last not least, it, it should make us think why this extension of the very post-colonial analytical framework on the Soviet, on the Russian case still tends to create resistance in certain quarters in the first place. And perhaps this has something to do with, uh, with um, uh, our own inheriting of, of, uh, of the frameworks that, uh, that maybe we should now critically reflect on and revise. I stop there, thank you. Thank you, Maria. I mean, it, it is, it's interesting to note on your final point that a number of um, different kind of academic communities and other communities that study the region are, are now being forced to kind of decenter their discussion to the extent to which uh, it's, it's, you know, it's always been Russia and East European studies is maybe is it worth thinking of it? And how do we, how do we call the region? Do we call it, obviously, do we call it post-Soviet anymore? Do we call it Eurasia is a term that now is very political and, and not really used, but it, it does, it does help us. I mean, this, obviously this book is only beginning the process of beginning to think about how we Think of decenter the region away from its former imperial center as well. Um, Arman, uh, I now invite you to talk, to talk to us about what you think this tells us about the inner empire. Arman is an expert on um, the, the former uh, Soviet republics uh, in general. So what, what does this t tell you about someone who's been working on this part of the world for, for decades? And is this, is this helpful? In what ways does it help? In what ways can it, can it, um, can it be improved? Thank you, Will. Uh, let me first congratulate you and Professor Cooper for this achievement 
with the book, which I read with uh, very big enthusiasm, actually. I'm still keeping reading it every day, by the way. And uh, congratulate with bringing this uh, interesting and yet uh, for us insiders from the empire, different parts of the empire, former empire, quite an unusual perspective of postcoloniality that adds not exactly postcoloniality as itself with respect to the former Soviet world, but uh, the postcoloniality lens applied to constitution building and constitutional studies in general. This is a very unusual lens, and I really welcome your um, effort to bring this discussion to the constitutional studies, comparative constitutional studies applicable to the region. And uh, since, again, you invited me to this project, and since I have started reading the very uh, exciting, uh, in a very exciting way, the book, I myself am asking myself, why was this lens, why was this post-colonial perspective actually ignored in uh, not only the constitutional studies in general in the post-Soviet space, but uh, about studying uh, Russian and post-Russian empire in general. And to be honest, I, I'm not ready to answer that question at all, if anyone is ever able to provide a comprehensive answer to this question. What I can provide at the moment is probably, um, and this I, I see added value in doing this because as academics, they should come with a critical mind also. And this is about um, exactly pointing out to the challenges of doing that rather than the mere opportunities. I think we share the insight about that this uh, new lens brings a lot of opportunities to the students like us. But what are the challenges? And I see a few of them, and I would like to actually frame my uh, presentation around this uh, spectacular, I would say, challenges of applying the post-colonial lens to the post-Soviet uh, space, and especially the countries of the inner empire. And one of these challenges, uh, I think, uh, is uh, quite fundamental, and it is about the challenge that the very theory of post-coloniality, of colonialism, might uh, have with its own inner internal identity crisis, because this enterprise uh, makes us to think and probably rethink about the definitions of what are post-colonial, what are colonial, etc. What do we want to say about applying the colonial lens to the post-Soviet space? This is because exactly the uh, Russian Empire itself and the Soviet uh, world has been rather ignored in the uh, studies of colonialism and uh, of Probably this new perspectives also has to uh, make the theory to redefine itself, to find its own identity closer. Uh, and the next challenge would I see in this context, which is very much related, if this is the case, and if we place the Soviet Union among the studies of the uh, colonialism and post-colonialism, then probably we need to also do a better job, and this is probably your 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 book opens the discussion and the debate on this, which I welcome very much. So, about placing the uh, Soviet Union as an empire into the larger context of comparative studies on colonialism and colonialism, and I see your book has done a very good job actually identifying at least some of the very interesting points that. Uh, contrast the Soviet empire from the context of a very conventional colonial theory. If we uh, look at the debate about the quite trivial and uh, basic debate about what has been the nature of colonial rule in different parts of the world and the comparative political science, for example, doing a very, uh, having a very rich studies about what has been the impact of uh, this or that rule, the British versus the French or the Spanish, etc., on development from economic point of view, but also on the political institutions in this or that part of the uh, colonial uh, uh, world, then uh, the question we might want to ask, what has been actually the nature of the uh, 
Russian colonial rule and the Soviet colonial rule, and I wouldn't identify this to be very close to each other. The book has done, and Maria referred to this, and I, uh, I find this a very spectacular point that actually what defined the Soviet colonial rule was probably its uh, complete um, deviation from the main pattern that was discussed in the colonial theory so far, and that's the economic extraction, that the emphasis on economic extraction of the colonial powers. And if we are saying, and the book is actually saying, that the Soviet rule actually deviated from this pattern, then how to define the Soviet colonial uh, power in terms of its nature? Of course, it was more political than economic. I think there is a lot of evidence for this. But is that so uh, also straightforward that uh, uh, the nature of the Soviet political rule from the uh, conventional Western oriented or European perspective, we may probably come to the same terms about the nature of the Soviet colonial power in terms of its political impact. But if we look from the perspective of how it was perceived in the different parts of the inner empire, again, and I have to emphasize the spectacular diversity of the backgrounds and the polities uh, within the inner empire from the Baltic states with a very consolidated uh, national identity and the uh, heritage of state in institutions. So probably the South Caucasus with still a very strong national identity, but a very strong lack of uh, state institutions or even a heritage of failed state institutions, if you wish. And to some of the Central Asian polities, which had uh, a heritage of uh, pre-Soviet, uh, rather nomadic, uh, nomadic institutions, and uh, complete lack of any state, state, state building and state institutions. So this uh, this is only one aspect that may explain the enormous diversity of this uh, inner space, which uh, we designate. But there are also more um, uh, specific uh, signs of this diversity, which speak about the constitutional answers to, post to the post-coloniality, uh, which also very much depend on the historical backgrounds of this polity. But if we go to the specifics of how constitutional answers uh, di were different uh, among this polities and the different parts of the inner empire. We may uh, identify very interesting uh, questions that uh, can reveal very much about uh, this polities and the nature of the colonial rule or the imperial rule that the Soviet Union actually exhibited. Let's take a point that the book actually brings, and it's a very interesting one, about uh, the extent to which different polities actually uh, tried to uh, put the reaction to the Soviet rule into the heart of constitutional constitution building or quasi-constitution building instruments, such as lustration, which was such a, such a common and uh, conventional instrument all over the Central and Eastern European periphery of the communist empire, if you wish, and if we refer to the inner empire, then to the Baltic states. It was from the very beginning of nation building and the uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, period, a very uh, fundamental instrument in uh, building the constitutional identity within this space. Uh, while moving further away from this region, we see responses that were quite different. Uh, on one hand, we can take Georgia and Ukraine, which embarked on lustration and uh, transitional justice instruments. But I would say quite uh, late in the process, but and also quite uh, in a retroactive or reactive rather way. For example, in Ukraine, the main debate about uh, lustration and the instrument of using lustration in uh, constitution building, but very much also in identity building, came about uh, approximately after the revolution in 2014 and Russia's first invasion into Ukraine with the Crimea being annexed. 
when uh, the lustration law has been actually discussed previously, but not has, uh, has been in the center of the discussions very much in Ukraine by then. When we move further to probably Armenia, we can see that illustration has been sometimes uh, popping out as an instrument that can uh, define constitutional responses to the Soviet Empire, but has never gained any momentum until now, probably until 2018, when we had our own revolution, which kind of contrasted us from the patterns, post-Soviet patterns. And yet, even now, it, it, it's not anyhow a very, very central uh, um, uh, point in the constitution building in Armenia. And then when we move to the Central Asia illustration and transitional justice, it's probably no, 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 not a, a point on, an, on their agenda at all. Uh, how to explain this diversity of reactions, except with the political patterns, with the state building heritage of historical heritage, etc. One way of uh, uh, looking at this, and again, the book does a very good job in at least uh, starting the discussion on this, is also probably from looking at the issues from the lens of the inherent traumas that each of the nations have uh, suffered, or some of them have identified as a uh, to be central to nation building from the point of post-imperial uh, uh, nation building uh, projects. And the traumas, uh, if we go through the region, uh, through the different polities in the inner space are quite different. And of course, most of them were caused primarily by the Soviet rule, but not necessarily and Armenia is here again, is one of the main deviations from the rule. And the book, the book brings this point about uh, a different trauma actually probably being a stronger one that defined uh, the constitution building project. And we definitely speak about the traumas from the Ottoman, rather the Soviet rule. And I have been myself asking this question very often about Armenia. Why, why didn't we ever come so close to rejecting the Soviet heritage, the repression, the Stalinist uh, repression, etc., in more stronger terms. And uh, now I understand probably it is that uh, there has been another trauma that was more defining into nation building, and probably that was in a comparative light, stronger and posed uh, stronger threats to existential threats probably to the nation and its uh, uh, emerging state building than the one that was defined by the Russian rule. Uh, another probably one of the last points of many that I would like to bring, but due to the limit on the time, I can bring another interesting perspective that is uh, raising some very interesting questions. Unfortunately, I have to bring questions rather than to try to answer the questions. But again, I welcome the book because it opens the discussion, the debate. I think there has to be a lot of work on the way to try to answer the, the multiple questions that the uh, field of study can pose and uh, make the challenges for the students like us to try to answer these questions. When I'm looking at the constitutional building, constitution building enterprises after the Soviet rule, and again, throughout the uh, countries of the inner, but also outers, uh, outer empire, one spectacular point and um, perspective is how the majority of countries that broke away from the Soviet or the communist rule rushed into uh, another uh, not necessarily imperial project, but maybe, maybe we can say a quasi-imperial project or something that at least had uh, uh, to do with uh, another uh, project that uh, is um, not completely in line with uh, understanding of the sovereign sovereignty and uh, the attempts, attempts to break away with the empire itself. But I'm, I'm talking about the aspirations of majority of the countries to the Euro-Atlantic integration. For one, if, if we are applying the constitutional lens to this, I, I recall that most of the Baltic states, and especially Estonia, had 
the most easy threshold uh, among all EU countries about the supremacy, constitutional doctrine about the supremacy of the EU law. So what does this tell us about? Uh, probably it tells us about uh, the lack of normativity perspective that uh, uh, will maybe um, has, um, we probably need to pay more attention to the normative aspects of the empires and their rule, rather than simply saying that this post-coloniality defines the responses. It's not only post-coloniality, but the exact nature of the colonial rule that uh, defines the responses. So it's uh, not probably the uh, absolutist uh, vision of sovereignty that drives the responses, but the nature of the Russian rule and the willingness to break uh, the Soviet rule and the willingness to break with its political patterns that drove uh, many of the countries into another integration project, which again, might potentially also limit the sovereignty of these countries. I think I'm already speaking for more than I'm supposed to. I, 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 I will be happy to respond to any questions in, in the meanwhile, but I hope that also raising some questions may bring to a um, fruitful debate in this forum, but also further in the, I uh, expect a quiet, uh, vibrant, uh, field of studies and discussions that the book opens about post-colonial lands applied to the former Soviet world. Thank you. Thanks, Arman. That's I mean, those questions are very important ones to answer. And I mean, one one thing that I mean, we can talk about in the Q and A in more detail, but is you know why is this post-colonial lens been so subdued? It could be, and this is something we saw across the region, which is that it was strategically subdued because there was so much continuity amongst elites when the Soviet Union collapsed. And you had in the in the Central and Eastern European Warsaw Bloc countries, the same people in power who were in power during the, the communist period. And of course, for them, they can't talk about it as post-colonial because they're the, they're the colonial kind of collaborators, right? And I think there's a similar story in parts of Central Asia and other parts of the inner empire as well, which I think is this. So it's so it's purposely strategically subdued and it's only emerging now, right? 30 years later, which tends to suggest what might help explain, you know, Zelensky, Petro Poroshenko and Ukraine and so forth. But we still have we still have um, Dinesha um, to go and, and to, to really Dinesha is going to, um, you know, tie up all the loose ends here of, of this discussion and tell us what does this tell us for more broadly, what you know, some people are calling twackle to the third world approaches or post-colonial approach to constitutional law following twail in the international law area. What does this tell us about that field, which is at the moment really growing? Thanks, Tanesha. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to engage with this book, which uh, uh, I can only echo those who've gone before me to say it's really an invitation to challenge our own thinking of, in how we approach our work and it's definitely um, adding a dimension uh, to the dominant approaches to our field. Before I continue, I would seek the indulgence of the audience. I have with me uh, three children in our home and a very excited dog. School holidays are on, so if you hear any screaming and barking, I, uh, I apologize in advance. I'm as far away as from them as I can be, possibly. So I uh, teach um, public law in Sri Lanka and all my research really has been shaped through the questions that I have encountered um, in seeking to uh, interpret the challenges of constitutional governance that I have experienced. And more recently, these questions have also taken me to the broader questions of comparative constitutional law what it means to uh, describe the global South in the context of comparative constitutional law, and increasingly the question about methods and methodology. So just to give you some flavor for what it is like to think about constitutional law from my context, the routine questions we ask uh, relate to questions about identity, sovereignty, conflict resolution, and memorialization all of which 
come across um, as important themes uh, in William and Herbert's book as well. So I read this book um, as a deeply challenging invitation uh, to broaden our frames of inquiry and to question our own approaches to our work. So congratulations, Will and Herbert, for this fantastic book. And I, I know the link to the introduction is uh, shared on the chat. For those of you who are on the call, I would highly recommend that you read this introduction in chapter one very closely because it, I think, offers a very clear and strong overview of the main claims that you make. So I have five points that I would like to share with you. I think the first, uh, some of which would uh, be uh, an echoing of what has been already said, but from a different perspective and perhaps also with a different emphasis. So the first is that this book offers, particularly to uh, scholars like myself who work in the Anglo-speaking world uh, when it comes to our work at the global level, it adds a missing piece to the dominant discourse on constitutional uh, developments and constitutional law. Uh, the missing piece, uh, um, the missing pieces are added in terms of geography, culture, politics, but also intellectual thought. Uh, I want to say something more later about uh, Will's recent piece on crown presidentialism. Um, so for those of us who are in places like Sri Lanka and other parts of the global south, uh, the conversation that is um, offered in this book offers um, clear intellectual framing and language with which we could again, begin to seek answers for some of the questions that we've been grappling with. The book itself is very good description and therefore it's gap filling and educational. So very useful for anyone who wants to, I think, uh, get into this conversation. It equips us and brings us to the same level. The second and related point, I think, is that it is an important corrective to what uh, Will and Herbert describe as the post authoritarian account of constitutional law and development. Um, I think there are several spheres which are implicated in uh, this um, sort of buying into this idea of the post authoritarian narrative. It's the, it's the academics, it's the practitioners, institutions, actors, and it's also about how we approach constitutional reform. But in this book, uh, they argue that the post-colonial is not, not simply an alternative way of describing this story, but that it is a necessary way of describing this story. And for me, that is a very uh, useful point. On that, I think Will and Herbert make the point that in studying constitutions as text, but also in locating constitutions in their context, the post-colonial is a necessary lens. Now, for those of us who, are, uh, who think about these issues from the South Asian perspective, this may not sound new, but I think what you do in this book offers us different ways of thinking about the post-colonial and also, interestingly, gives us um, new connections to draw between what we traditionally look to, the British Empire and its former colonies. Here is this large chunk of the world, which we have not really paid attention to for different reasons, but which has so much to offer. So related to that, uh, still on my second point, um, I think this, the, the arguments made in this book help us to think through um, the limits of what is described often as a second wave of constitutionalism, which happened in the, since the 1990s. The um, idea that constitutionalism um, is something that you work towards, there's a linear progression, it's to do with institutional reform, certain kinds of constitutional design, is partly true, but it's, it's missing certain very important uh, foundational understandings. And I think this book helps us to meet that gap. The third point I want to make is that um, what you offer uh, in this book is an excellent example of how those of us who are not studying the usual suspects in this field 
can make a meaningful contribution to what Sherry Saunders has described as the global gene pool. Um, perhaps because of language, perhaps because of the political ideological divide, the Russia and the post-Soviet world has been considered as something that is unique, something that necessarily does not sit in conversation with regions like South Asia. But as I mean, I've already said, you help us to see that there is a different way of seeing it. But also more importantly, as you rightly point out in your introduction, in post-colonial discourse, we often focus on the former colonies. But because of the Russian and post-Soviet experience, your work reminds us that it's also important to go back to the center and study the center. Uh, and see the impact on the center, but also to see the center and the former colonies in relation to each other. And how are we to do that? If we focus on doctrine, if we focus on constitutional institutions, and if we focus on constitutional actors, it is not easy to broaden the frame of conversation in that way. So not only do you help us to see how to do comparative work well, but you also uh, remind us that in comparative work, there's also the need to study context, which brings me then to this, the, what I think is the deepest challenge you throw out in this book, the question of history. I mean, we've had these conversations before in different contexts, but what comes out clearly for me in this work is the need to problematize history. And you speak about ideological history. And of course, we are looking at two different parts of the world, but I'm reading this and I'm nodding in agreement because I see the same work being done by ideological history in my own context and in my region. So the nation building project that you speak about is so useful and relevant to understand. And this is why I think comparative work is so interesting because you can look across at something that seems to be so different, but looking across at that experience helps you to come back with a much more nuanced understanding and perspective, which encourages you to think about your own context differently. So this book helps me to do that. And I would like to thank both authors for that. Um, which then brings me um, to the final point I wanted to make. So what does all of this have to offer for the broader conversation going on in comparative constitutional studies, in thinking about the post-colonial and also the decolonization discourse? So what does this have to offer to the academic inquiry of decolonization? As we all know, Increasingly, we are talking about the Global South and the need to include the Global South and make, um, to ensure that the Global South is represented in academic inquiry on constitutional law. And then we have these uh, debates about what that means for method, what that means for authenticity, etc. cetera. But, um, and, and as I've written elsewhere, I have also, while I use the term the Global South, I'm also mindful that as a category, it has its limitations. And this book highlights those limitations. Um, how do you account for the idea of the Global South and the North when you begin to think about the post-Soviet as post-colonial? So I come to this book as someone who realizes that this displaces really the global south. It decenters the global south. Please give me one minute, please. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm uh, single parenting at home, I apologize. Um, so the global south as a category is displaced by the arguments you make in this book. And it troubles it. And I think in the most productive way uh, possible. Uh, it clarifies for us that a linear approach to understanding constitutional developments is useful, but is limited. And in fact, it, if you continue to go back to the idea of the problematic use of history, it helps you to see that there is more of a uh, evolution in the form of a cycle going on, rather than this endless journey towards uh, better implementation of constitutionalism. So we focus then 
equally on process, not just on outcome. And finally, uh, the multiple effects of decentering the Global South in comparative constitutional studies. I see the multiple effects in terms of helping us to see and incorporate this region and its experiences into the conversation on constitutional law. Uh, it decenters in terms of method. I think it's safe to say that now in B, there is consensus that while studying courts um, is important, that it is really one part of the, one small part of the story, um, and then finally it decenters in terms of um, experience. Uh, if you think about what the world is experiencing, the questions that you raise in this book, I think, are more relevant to the majority of the world than some of the more dominant conversations you've had in this field. So I will end there will, but just want to underscore that I think what your project has offered to people like us who are um, committed to understanding what the Global South means in comparative constitutional law, an important reminder uh, that the, here is this entire body of experience and knowledge with which we can do that work and go beyond, broaden, keep broadening the conversation keep broadening the conversation beyond the usual suspects. So thank you to you both. Thanks, Dinesha. Um, so I now invite everyone to um, put questions into the chat. Um, and while we do that, I, you know, this, this has been an incredibly um, enlightening conversation. I want to thank all of the um, panelists for, um, for their engagement with this book. Um, and I want to um, as people are thinking of their questions, I want to raise something that's come up, I think, in all three of the discussions, which is to what extent this, um, you know, this, this kind of discussion that we've had, we have in the book, raises a question of the role of constitutions in forms of historical discourse, right? I mean, and I think this is something, so I want to ask Maria first on this, to what extent in the area of historical memory, people think about constitutional text is, is, is constitutional text talked about? I mean, because I know the historical memory focuses a lot on on, on memorials, museums, um, public kind of commemoration of events, and so forth. But obviously, constitutions play this really fascinating role, right? In acclamation, you're you know you're voting for it, and so forth. Like, to what extent do we think of constitutions as playing this kind of key role in a in a form of historical discourse, right? A kind of constitutional historical discourse. So, I'll start with Mar Maria, and then. Um, you know, I'm sure that our men, Dinesha and Herbert, come in if they got um, thoughts and questions on this. But I mean, Maria, what, to what extent is this thought about? And to what extent, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think the short answer is that I don't think it is very uh, extensively actually engaged with, uh, uh, at least not in my field. But I think this is also changing. I mean, you know, your your book is an obvious uh, opening of the discussion uh, in Copenhagen, where I'm located. At uh, there is a very interesting uh, comparative constitutionalist uh, project, which very much engages with this uh, question of, you know, what do the East European constitutions um, do and relate to in terms of the sort of historical dialogues and also sort of future looking um, dimensions, uh, relationship to Europe in particular. There is this, this project by uh, Professor Jan Komarek uh, called Imagine, uh, Imagining Europe. Um, uh, so, you know, inevitably, I think uh, the case studies, uh, the, the little engagement that I've had with this project from the sidelines, um, you can see that the question of uh, uh, the place of, of these um, nations and countries uh, um, self-identification, you know, legally and politically in Europe is inevitably related to the question of, of uh, why this place was, was denied or why this place was, so to speak, blocked for, for uh, quite some time uh, in the 20th century. So uh, there you could say the, the future and past obviously come together. But I think it's, it's yet to be uh, uh, discovered. Perhaps uh, the alertness to the constitution, 
as uh, also a politically interesting text was more there uh, in the immediate aftermath of the actual rupture in the early 1990s. And I think it's now again coming back, maybe, you know, uh, certain certain uh, reflection periods are needed uh, before people can revisit uh, this again. And, and, and there certainly seems to be a momentum if I think of your book and this uh, particular project uh, together. Yeah, and it's interesting you raise that. I mean, the, the one of the, I mean, I think there is sometimes a view, particularly amongst political scientists and some historians, that what constitutional lawyers do is all about court cases. And, you know, and it's that kind of legal constitutionalism, which, of course, we do stuff with courts, obviously, right? But we do more than that. We think about more than that. And we can contribute to more than that, I think. Um, and that's, I guess, part of what um, Herbert and I were, were thinking about with this book is to think about, you know, these, these institutions, these of constitutions as a kind of playing this incredibly important political role, right? We can think of referendums, how often, the, how re, you know, like the 2020 re, uh, constitutional change that Herbert mentioned, which is so significant in the Russian Federation, did not need to go to a referendum. In fact, it could have just been passed by the legislatures, yet the Kremlin and President Putin decided to strategically put it to a referendum, right? So constitutions play this really important political acclamation role uh, in that. Yeah, is something so you want to come in on this? Yeah, right. I quickly just just mm. to add and and uh, you know I think in a way it's also something that actually uh, scholars of of uh, memory laws have uh, become recently uh, increasingly interested in. I mean the the question of you know mnemonic constitutionalism, what two constitutions as legal and political texts actually remember and in what sense can we also uh, understand constitutions uh, constitutional texts per se as as also particular types of memory laws i mean my my own colleagues in the framework of the memocracy project that we have you know between four universities uh, Ulat Belavuzau and Alexander Glesinska Grabias have written interestingly about this um, notion of mnemonic constitutionalism in the Hungarian context. And of course, this is something that I think you you uh, strongly raise uh, in light of uh, Russian uh, 2020 constitutional amendments, because there is there is clearly um, you know, also, of course, an explicit uh, ambition to to uh, set uh, another legal framing for for the historical memory of uh, Russia and and uh, and uh, you know beyond actually, because it is via this text that uh, uh, current Russia also seeks to discipline and and police the broader. Uh, range of uh, remembering uh, its its own um, uh, Soviet past, yeah, and very much doing that beyond you know Russian itself, doing that also in uh, in uh, with an ambition to regulate it, you know, both in the what used to be the inner and as well as the outer empire. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking about the the role of law in disciplining, I think, is a really important. Uh, um, aspect of this. So we have a question that's come in from Max Stoyer uh, that I think is going to, I'm going to uh, give to Herbert here. And he says, and Max asks, the first question he has is, I wonder what the benefits are to study the developments of the post-Soviet space via the post-colonial lens, right? So a, a question to some extent that draws a little bit on some of our men's points. What are the benefits here? What are we getting out of this that goes beyond the traditional post-authoritarian lens? And he asks in particular from the perspective of, of the risk of seeing the outer empire countries, the Visegrad countries, as former colonies being used as apologies for illiberal and anti-minority rhetoric and policy. So, so what, do, what do we, so what, would you, what would you say to this, Herbert? I'll, I'll pass this over to you. To, to what extent is, is a post-colonial reading, is it itself arguably playing into the, to the rhetoric of, for instance, Viktor Orban and the, and the Fidesz party? Or how do I mean? Obviously, we're taking a critical view of this, but what does what does the benefit of seeing this in a post-colonial? What does it help us understand? Yes, well, thank you very much, and Max Steyer, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think this is a very relevant one. Um, I would answer it shortly that our book and post-colonial studies in general can try to uh, make obvious the manipulative potential of politics of the past in a post-colonial setting. Um, you are quite right. It might be used to uh, to relieve 
those illiberal governments from, uh, um, from responsibility, but we try to do the exact opposite. We try to show how they use constitutional text, how they use uh, public debate on colonial past by distorting it in order to um, um, in order to establish their own power. So we try to look behind the curtain, so to speak, and make obvious uh, well, what I would call the manipulative potential of politics of the past. Because if you take this post-colonial lens, you much more than in post-authoritarian or democratic constitutional theory, look at law in action, constitution in action, at the political, at the sociological, at the uh, economic uh, relations and effects. And in doing so, I think we, in our book, we have a case study on Hungary uh, describing and uh, analyzing exactly this, how Viktor Orban uses his own perspective of the past, making it a normative one, and thus imposing it on the state and on society, and thus by manipulating public memory and prescribing public memory, tries to um, well, stay in power, to, to put it shortly. Um, so I think post-colonial studies, if you take them seriously, uh, will not excuse illiberal governments, but much rather show their mechanisms of power. I think this is exactly what, Dinesh, I see you uh, uh, saying yes. I think this is exactly what uh, post-colonialism is about, to show not only the power structures of, of colonialism, but to show how post-colonial systems perhaps continue these to the benefit of local elites, um, how they profit from, from colonial heritage. Um, and uh, perhaps one, one uh, more general remark on politics of the past and, and the role of constitutions. Um, I think we have a very uh, important point here, the German-speaking uh, constitutional legal theory is just discovering these symbolic and political dimensions of constitutional law, of what constitutional texts may do beyond merely uh, regulating. Um, this has been a novel story for perhaps 20 years now, so this is still very developing, and I think I will try to develop a future research project on that with respect to Eastern Europe, trying to discover the symbolic um, potential of, of Eastern European constitutions. If you look at Croatia, to give one example, you have a, a, a preamble which is pages and pages describing Croatian history. And this constitution was enacted in 1990, that is in a situation when Croatia tried to get out of uh, domestic Yugoslav, Serb, greater Serb colonialism. So it's not by chance that exactly in such a uh, historical situation, the constitution contains a, an extremely long preamble on national history. Um, so I think it's uh, this is a very exciting door, which we tried to push more open with our book as well. We just discovered, the, for at least for us, we discovered that. That okay. door only in this book. And one last remark, the roads of referenda in order to create political cohesion here in Germany is a very good example, because when we had our reunifications, re reunification, that was done without a, a referendum, and that would have been an excellent opportunity to hold a referendum whether the two German states would want to unite. And why didn't we have one? Because there was fear that it would show how little support reunification enjoyed in the western part of Germany. And in order not to show that, uh, the the uh, political elites as we said we won't ha uh, have a referendum. They didn't need to legally, and so they said we, we won't have it. Um, this, I think, very much highlights uh, the uh, the political cohesion uh, role of referenda. Thank you very much. And I could also add to this, which is to Max's question, which is a good one, is to say that the post-colonial condition is one that constitutions play a very, I think, quite potentially problematic role, right? Because constitutions become ways of solidifying a particular official version of history, right? Which in, in many cases, what I call ideological history in a recent piece I just wrote for the American Historical Association, a kind of strategic, polit politically created form of history, right? That is, that is often about a return to an idealized past. And we see, and the constitution becomes a way of kind of advancing that um, that or, or further embedding that, enacting that, acclimating that in a particular society. And so it's, it's actually constitutions that can play quite a problematic role in trying to form it or solidify a, a form of history when, of course, a professional historian would always say com history is complex and history is, is contested and should, and should remain that way. Um, we can learn from history, but we don't 
Uh, but by settling history and constitutional text, we create uh, potential problems. Now, Dinesh is nodding and, and wanted to get in. You want to jump in on this point on the kind of politics of history and post-coloniality, Dinesha? Uh, just to say, I mean, I agree, obviously, with what you and Herbert have said so far. Um, but also going further on this question to show how useful the post-colonial lens can be uh, by exposing the mechanics of power within constitutions. I think it also helps us by giving us a vocabulary to call it out when constitutional actors use ideological history. And um, particularly in contexts like Sri Lanka where there, is, um, there are plural claims for internal determination. Uh, to it gives us the language with which you can critique the majoritarian approach approaches to constitutional governance. And post-colonial yet colonial, the post-colonial critique also helps us to see the different layers within the state. So you see the state and the state speaks in different voices. And then you see the local. And very often what you see is the local wants to challenge the state. And that is when the post-colonial critique actually becomes useful because the state is now speaking the language of the former empire and using the same technologies to do that. So in many ways, uh, while governments may selectively use the rhetoric of post-colonial critique, actually there is tremendous opportunity for constitutionalists to take on board the intellectual uh, tools offered by the post-colonial critique to advance constitutionalism in very context specific ways. Thanks. And this, this actually raises the point. Armand, Armand, I'm gonna bring you in on this question. The second question we have from Mariam Zulfa. Um, so you can, I, she asked a question about strongmen colonial leaders and, you know, and, the, and the way in which maybe there's a post-colonial critique of this, say, well, a strongman leadership is actually, this is, this is, this is the old imperial way. Right, we we actually so there's actually a very strongly kind of democratic uh, post-colonial critique I think here, which could play out as a role. So Armand, I want to bring you in on, on that question or anything else you wanted to say with regards to what we've been talking about. Probably to start with the uh, previous question, I also agree that actually in the recent time the Soviet uh, or Soviet entities in a way they rediscover what constitution is or what it can be. Because previously, I agree with you uh, that uh, constitution was predominantly viewed as uh, a collection of rules about how to organize the organize the power, or using the terminology of uh, Sartori, actually, which uh, delivered a sem seminal piece for myself of what the constitution is or what it can be. Actually, the, the states are actually rediscovering the constitution, and here we should probably not even look at the constitution as only the constitutional text the text which is called the constitution, but also if we were refer to the variety of memory laws as constitutional laws, laws which have to do something with constitutionality in the legal sense of the world. Then again, there is a huge proliferation of constitutional law, which is bearing about, uh, on uh, identity building, uh, state building and memory. Memory and history plays a very critical role in these processes about identity building and state building. And there is a huge proliferation of this kind of constitutional law, especially in view of also the political and geopolitical uh, developments. And this play a critical role anyway in constitution building, I should say. Russia's, uh, Russia's uh, neo-imperial project, its invasion of Ukraine, but not, not only Ukraine, uh, look at uh, the most recent examples about um, uh, the, about criminalization of denial of Holocaust. Basically, about, about uh, sorry, not Holocaust, but Holodomor. Uh, of parliaments actually uh, uh, recognizing genocides, Holodomor, let it be Holodomor, the Armenian genocide, etc. As such, this is a constitutional act by itself, if you wish. Probably not a legal document, not a legal act, but a constitutional act in a way. On the other hand, Russia actually decriminalizing or recognizing the blockade of Leningrad as genocide. And in a way, it already uh, enacted a lot of laws which criminalize denial of uh, uh, crimes uh, which are related to denial of uh, 
denial of, of genocides and, and, and such acts. So there is a proliferation and it is closely related to also the geopolitical um, developments and in a way is a reaction to what is happening in the geopolitical scene. Uh, on uh, strong leadership, if uh, I may ask you, William, to rather clarify the question for me and the question that was, I understand, posed by well, someone I, in the audience. Largely, the question is, to what extent does, can you, can you see strongman kind of leadership, which is often justified as a, as a necess necessity in post-colonial governance, right? Because you have a weak state, you have, but at the same time, it's, it's, often, a re it's a, often a reproduction of the old imperial forms of authority, right? And, and so I guess the question is to really say, or maybe we've already answered it to some extent, I think, is to say that it's both the post-colonial condition is one that suggests, it does suggest arguably, maybe at least in the short term, a need for some level of centralization to overcome the emergency of independence. And this comes, I, I see we've got a, another question from Aziz Ismatov, and he mentions the Central Asian countries who in many cases were simply unprepared for independence. And I think we, we refer to in the book as the Central Asian countries to some extent were had independence thrust upon them. Um, in many cases, there were referendums in these countries which did not want, want independence. Um, so it's, so I think there's an interesting question around post-coloniality here and, you know, and legacies and, and those, but the, I mean, one of the points I think what we raised, which we've talked about throughout this session as well, is how these questions of post-coloniality continue, right? They don't go away. Um, and we can think of how obviously Viktor Orban has raised this almost 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet empire and, and it has become an issue, uh, obviously in, in Ukraine and in Russia 30 years after as well would come to a real head. Uh, in the war. Um, we're, we're really almost out of time, but I do want to get to the final question that Aziz has. Um, and this is a question that goes to um, a similar theme. And this is that he, he, he says, in some post-Soviet regions, there's still a popular opinion that Russia was actually, quote, giving out more than it was taking from the colonized nations, as opposed to more what we'd see as kind of more traditional South Asian Constitutionalism, and I, I want to actually write, give this to Dinesh. Is, is that true? Was was there ever a d discourse in in other forms of imperialism that actually imperialism is a good thing, um, and that and that the imperialized individuals themselves felt that they weren't in an empire? Um, and if so, yes. I, mean, I wonder if there was, because I mean, an empire is a very complex thing, and you often get many members of of in, individuals who are imperial in imperial states who don't see themselves as actually in an imperial state. Dinesh. This is a great conversation to have, uh, really. Um, if you speak to my parents' generation, uh, it's not difficult to find people who would say life was better under the empire. And they were born just as Sri Lanka was getting independence. And I've heard this in other parts of the former empire as well. Um, so the examples given are transport, education, health, and um, of course, Sri Lanka's welfare state, which up until the crisis was quite robust, was established under colonial rule. But which then, and I suppose here, I would be very curious to know what all of you have to say about this. Even when we think of the empire, it's important to remember that the, the, the concept of law and constitutional governance that traveled out of the empire was also one which carried with it its own tensions. So it came with democracy, it also came with autocratic rule. It came with uh, extraction and capitalism and also welfare. So again, coming back to Herbert's point, the post-colonial lens is enormously useful in seeing law, constitutions, institutions as contested. Whereas in the post-autocratic approach, there is, I think, a flattening out of all of this and uh, narrowing down to doctrine and institutions. I'll say no more, but so much more to discuss here. Really. You need to write another book, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we are out of time, I'm afraid, but I think the, you know, the, to finish on this, it actually we use it in the title, the you know, dynamic, right? This is the idea, the post-colonial paradigm is a dynamic one, and it's one that's changing, um, but, that's, but that is one, that, and it's contested, and I think that's important um, to, to raise and to say in the, as a final word. I want to thank all the panelists for, uh, for reading this book. I want to thank you all for, for joining us.
Um, and we hope that this discussion, I mean, it seems like it could keep going, I could go for another hour or so, and um, that will continue uh, in, argue, in, in conferences and, and so forth, and in books that, that come out of this project. We have just begun this, so thank you all.